Good morning, and welcome back to Second Peter. We are just in our third lesson now, uh, after the introduction, actually the second lesson, introduction and the first few verses, and now we're going further. I'm going to be reading a longer passage, but we won't be concentrating on all of it. Uh, this is a passage we'll be in for quite some time, and so I hope that you will get your Bible and follow along as I read it. Uh, I just, just a reminder that one of the things we talked about last week was that Peter is encouraging and reminding us that once a person is in the faith, in other words, they've been born again, they are a regenerate um, Christian who has the Holy Spirit living inside them, there's an expectation from God's point of view, that that new life that is living inside us will result in change. And so he is going to be telling us what kind of changes need to happen. And um, it's, it's a very interesting list. We're not going to get into the list so much today as we are just talking about the kind of attitude he wants us to have as we pursue this. But let's read the passage it's Second Peter 1, 3 through 11. His divine power, that would be God's divine power, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and, with, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So that's a long passage, but it's uh, it's easy to break it down, and um, it's uh, one of the things that you learn when you're doing Bible study is you look for these clauses or uh, prepositional phrases or these. Um, these kind of introductory, like at the beginning of a sentence or in the middle of a sentence, you'll see this this phrase that gives you information of how to interpret. And so, and this is no different uh, because he says, he's telling us about his divine power. And then he says, by which he has granted us his uh, very precious and great promises. In other words, uh, the by which refers back to the power, that power is the um, the tool that God uses uh, to give us these promises. And then he says, so that through them, in other words, the purpose is so that you may become partakers of the divine nature. And so it's very interesting to look for those. They help you understand what the writer is saying. Now, First of all, the question is, what has God provided to those of us who have given our hearts to Jesus? And it's obvious the very first thing is power. He has given us his power. Uh, but his power is for the purpose of giving us life and godliness. And um, he, he even tells us another thing that he's provided is that he's called us into his own glory and excellence. In other words, that he has purposed and called us that we get to experience his own glory 
and his excellence. We're going to talk about the word excellence next week, but this idea that we are participating with him in his own DNA, if you will, his spiritual DNA, that once we uh, are born again, we have a spiritual DNA that is no longer that of uh, the first Adam, you know, the sin, the sinful um, nature that came into the world. That has been pushed aside, and now we have the DNA of Jesus Christ, the second Adam. And so we have that divine nature. We are, we have it for the purpose of allowing us to share in the glory and excellence of Jesus. Uh, But also he's telling us that he's given us very great and precious promises. And we're going to look at some of those promises in a minute. Um, So that through those promises, we become partakers of that divine nature. We are actively involved in acquiring that divine uh, or in, in experiencing that divine nature. And it's also another reason, another purpose of that is that it is allowing us to escape from the corruption that's in the world because of that sin nature that still resides in us. There's this battle between the sin nature and the new DNA of Jesus Christ. And so he goes on and says, uh, to supplement your faith with these seven qualities, virtues, and we're going to be looking at those next week. Um, But then I want to skip down. He says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Because remember, um, this word knowledge is really important here. We talked about it a lot last week, that the word knowledge here, epinosis, is speaking of an experiential kind of knowledge, not a head knowledge not just an academic um, knowledge, but knowledge that you know through experience. And so the knowledge that we have of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be able, if, as, as we increase that knowledge through adding these particular virtues to our lives, uh, we will be effective. We won't be ineffective and unfruitful. We will be effective and fruitful. Um, in our walk with him. So let's uh, look at some of the promises that God has given to his children. Some are obvious. Some are just the the actual, um, the gospel presentation. And so we look at that in Acts 2, 38, which uh, Peter said to the crowd after the Holy Spirit had been poured out. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So there's two promises there, that um, forgiveness of our sins is promised by Jesus Christ, and also the promise that we get the Holy Spirit. The second promise that we're looking at is uh, the one we've already seen in Second Peter 1, 4, where his divine nature has granted to us all things. So we get to experience his divine nature. But uh, also another promise is in 1 John 3, 2, and that is uh, a, a further explanation of this divine nature, where John says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. So there's a great divine promise that we will be like Jesus. His divine nature will be in us to the degree once we are face to face with Jesus that we will look like him. And that's pretty exciting to me. Another, um, another, promise that we have is in Acts 1 verse 11. Um, Jesus is going to return and this is uh, where the uh, disciples are standing around after the ascension of Jesus Christ wondering what's next and um, angels appeared and said to them, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? 
this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So what a great promise, and it's one that we all cling to uh, in our lives, is that Jesus is coming back, and that is a, uh, just a complete reversal of this entire history of Jesus' life since the crucifixion is that everything will change. Will The church age will change to one of just complete perfection. It's a, it'll be a return to the Garden of Eden in some ways. And then the final promise that I put into this uh, section is eternal life in heaven. And we, we read of that in 1 Peter 1, 4, um, back, way back when we first started this study, where um, Peter ex- expounded on the fact that our inheritance is kept in heaven for us. So heaven is the place where we will uh, experience the fullness of our salvation, is eternal life in heaven. Uh, and so there, there are so many promises. I actually did Google Bible promises, and the number of sites that came up that can give you just list and list and list of, of promises from the Bible was really pretty surprising to me. I had no idea that um, somebody's figured out all the promises in God's Bible. Uh, there's someone gave me years ago a calendar, 365 promises for 365 days. And so the promises are everywhere. But Peter is, he's just saying there's so many promises that he's given us, so many precious and very great promises. But those promises are of no value to us unless we are being obedient to the Holy Spirit's leading in our lives in those promises, because most of those promises come with a condition. If you do this, God does that. And so um, the same as what Peter's saying here, that he granted us these promises so that through them we may become partakers of the divine nature. Um, In other words, that it's this partnership. We talked about that last week, that it's a partnership between us and God. Now, um, Peter is stating here very clearly in verse 5, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Um, So, for this very reason, what reason would that be? Well, the reason is everything in 3 and 4. Um, the, he's saying, look back to the previous two verses. Before we go on to what we are to do, look back and see the reason for doing those things. Obviously, the reason is, well, he gave us the power to do these things. He wants us to have life and godliness. He wants us to experience his own glory and excellence. He wants us to understand the value of these promises. He wants us to be partakers of his divine nature. He wants us to escape the corruption that is in the world. And he's provided a way for all of that to happen. And so for that reason, why wouldn't we go forward and pursue these particular characteristics? That is the reason he wants us to pursue them. I mean, it's almost like, duh, why wouldn't we? God has made it so possible. He's made it completely within our reach because of the power that he puts inside us through the Holy Spirit. So he says, after for this very reason, he says, make every effort. Now, what kind of effort is that? Make every effort. Well, he's pretty serious about it. And and first of all, he's very serious about it. He wants us to to do it with a lot of intentionality. We looked at Philippians 2.12 last week, but I want to see it one more time, just part of it here. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Um, 
work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What in the world is fear and trembling in this idea of working out our salvation? Well, one way to look at it is that, first of all, God is the one who works into us redemption. He's the one who forgives us our sins. He's the one who implants his Holy Spirit into us. So he works that into us. He's now calling us to work it out into a a lifestyle, to work it out into something that's practical, something that shows so that others can see that we are um, belong to Jesus Christ because it's affected the way we live our lives. Uh, it was John Bunyan um, from like 300 years ago um, who said the Christian life should be very practical. And so as we work out our salvation, we're to do it with this holy fear and trembling. In other words, we are going to do it with so much intentionality, so much vigor, so much diligence, because number one, he's asked us to, and number two, how could we not in light of all that he has done for us? So in a, in a spirit of gratitude, we work out our salvation. But also fear and trembling would suggest that we're doing it because the consequences of not doing it are pretty severe. The, the, the thought of not taking advantage of all the resources that God has put inside us is a slap in his face. And so we should be very, um, very seriously approaching this idea of um, working out our salvation with fear and trembling. Another passage that has always been very um, powerful to me, a powerful warning, is in Hebrews 2, 1 through 3, where he says, For this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? I want to start with neglecting so great a salvation because I think that here's kind of the core of of the problem with us when we're kind of lackadaisical Christians. We don't consider our salvation to be all that great. There's a um, a movie out right now called Overcomers, and the the main character in the movie, a coach, uh, was asked a very serious question by a man who was blind and couldn't see him. He said, tell me who you are. Who are you? And he listed, well, I'm a coach, high school basketball coach. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I like this. I like that. And I think number six on his list was, oh, yeah, and I'm a Christian. And so it was it was like way down the list of things that he valued and things that he would say um, are signatures of who he is. And so it's he's neglecting the greatness of his salvation when he allows it to become something that's way down the list. But the greater warning here is in verse 1, where it says, uh, We must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. That idea of um, not if you don't value your salvation, there's a, a, a very good chance you're going to just drift away from it and, and completely um, forget how incredible that salvation is. And I saw this um, in, a, in an illustration, a true story in the, from the book Glenda's Long Swim. And this is a very old book back in the 80s. But Glenda and Robert Lennon um, were four miles off the coast of Florida in the Gulf of Mexico fishing in their yacht all by themselves. It was a beautiful afternoon, so Glenda decided that she would take a swim in the water and do some spear fishing with a mask and a snorkel. Well, all of a sudden, she realizes she's 50 yards from the boat, 
and she's in a current that is taking her further out, and she calls to her husband, Robert. And Robert, without thinking, he just dives in and goes after her. Uh, he gets there to where she is, and they both realize that they're being carried out fairly quickly, uh, further and further away from the boat. He is a champion swimmer, and she is not. What are they going to do? Uh, because she can't make it to the boat against that strain. She's not that great of a swimmer, um, and he can't carry her. So the plan they have is this for her to just simply tread water. And so he turns around and she goes with the tide. He turns around and swims against the tide. He keeps on swimming and finally uh, makes it back to the boat. It took him, I think it said six hours that he swam. And so um, ultimately the next day, um, a, a man in the uh, fishing business said he knew these waters pretty well and their tides, and he was willing to go after her. And they found her alive and very shaken, but she was 20 miles away. And so um, the, the idea here is that the, if you don't swim against the tide, you will float away. Um, just floating, just dog paddling is not going to keep you a, a, s close to the Lord. The tides of this world, the currents of a culture will pull us away. And so we must be very, very proactive, very, very intentional in our walk with Christ. I heard a very... Um, vivid testimony yesterday in one of the groups from a woman who the, her testimony of her walk with Christ was so similar to the story of the swimming because she had broken her foot or something had happened health-wise where um, she was so distracted by her circumstances that she began to drift away from the Lord. And it was a gradual process, but um, for two years, she really just, it wasn't, it wasn't, she didn't intentionally turn her back on Jesus. She just woke up one day and realized, oh my goodness, I, I haven't prayed. I don't even know the last time I thought about my life with Jesus. And um, it was at that point that she turned back around and recommitted her life to Christ but she was telling, as she was telling us the story, I think she was even shocked her own self how um, subtly we can be pulled away by the culture or by the, our circumstances to the point that we're so far away that we don't even know how we got there. Now, um, the, the, let's go in, going back to our passage. Um, we look, need to look at some things later on in the passage in verses 9 through 11, the consequences of not developing these seven qualities. Um, in verse 9, for whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. And that's where my friend was um, in her testimony yesterday. It was It was that she just had become forgetful, um, and she didn't even remember exactly where it all started. She had a, a pretty good idea looking back, but she had certainly forgotten the value of redemption, the value of her salvation. And so Peter is saying that's exactly what happens, that we do forget. But then the benefit of staying intentional is found in verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if we are very uh, actively pursuing these qualities that are in, suggested in this um, passage, we'll live fruitful lives. And that is something that has always been um, front and center in the New Testament is fruit production. 
that you, you don't even have to, to look hard to find that, especially if you look at John 15 about the vine and the branches, because the whole idea of John 15 is fruit production. But the way that happens is by staying very, very attached to the vine, which is Jesus Christ. Now, I want to also look at um, this idea of making every effort to supplement your faith. This is uh, an interesting word here, supplement. That word has the idea of a very lavish, rich supplementation, where one goes to excessive lengths to make it happen. Uh, The theologian Hebert explains that the original imagery of this word that we translate supplement, in the Greek it's, um, I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, but it's epikorigo, Uh, was that of a rich patron lavishly supplying every need for the training and staging of a grand chorus for some public celebration. You know, that's just, can you picture that in the Greek culture uh, 2,000 years ago where the the whole um, tradition of plays and um, recitations that they're, they were so famous for, the, the idea was, and, and the way it actually was produced, was you would find patrons who were very wealthy, and they lavished their wealth into one production, into putting on um, with all the costumes and all the staging and all of the props and the sets uh, that were ne- needed to to result in a very very fine um, and excellent production, and I love that. I mean, you know, that's that's the original idea behind it, and that idea has faded. But the concept of a generous, creative, and cooperative activity between a patron, God. And us still remains because as believers, we are cooperating with God through the Holy Spirit. And we engage in this sort of cooperation with him in order to to produce a Christian walk, a life which gives credit to him. You know, and, and that's in the in the original usage and understanding of that word patron. Those patrons were honored uh, by the crowds and the audiences that saw those uh, performances, even more than the, the actors were honored. The patrons were honored. And so as we live lives that have been so lavished with every great and precious promise, we are living out one a, um, a life that people can see, and th- who gets the glory? Who gets the credit? Not us. It's our great patron, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who have so lavishly provided for us. He, the, you know, I saw I read a really cute thing from Spurgeon. Spurgeon says that you know where where Jesus said in Matthew. Uh, I think it's six, that six or seven, where Jesus uh, says that God provides for the sparrows. Spurgeon's commenting on that, and he says, yes, God does provide food for the sparrows, but he doesn't put it in the nest. In other words, those birds have got to, the mama bird has got to go out and, and find those worms and bring them back to the nest. And so the same is true of us. God provides so lavishly, but we have a role to play. We have things we must do. And so we are to make every effort to supplement our faith, that faith, which is a gift from God, that born again salvation. We are to supplement that salvation faith with a lifestyle that is going to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. 
it isn't working for it in the sense of, you know, the idea of legalistically working for something, but it's just allowing the God's Holy Spirit, His divine nature, to have power in our lives. And we cooperate with that power by developing, allowing Him to develop those things instead of fighting against Him. You know, it isn't really let go and let God, which was kind of a, a, a thing back in the maybe the 80s and 90s, is it's, it's all God. Yes, God is the only one who gives us the strength to, do in, to bring about any change in our lives. It's more, though, trust and obey. As we obey His promises and trust Him, there he, the song says, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. So that's, the, that's it for today. We will continue this next week as we look at those seven virtues and what they, um, how they impact our lives with Jesus. We'll see you next week.